Thanks everyone for joining us for this latest episode of the Green Left Show. Today we're going to be talking about the situation in Cuba in the wake of the uh, protests that received a lot of attention two months ago. Before we get started, I want to acknowledge that we are recording this show on stolen Aboriginal land. Uh, sovereignty was never ceded and genocide and uh, dispossession, colonialism are ongoing processes still relevant today and we pledge our ongoing commitment to struggles for justice for First Nations people. Also, I wanted to say if you like our work, please do become a supporter. It's plan start from only $5 a month. It is the best way to give support to, to Green Eft and to receive the material that we produce and makes an invaluable uh, contribution to our project. So thanks, thanks very much to everyone who already is a supporter and please, if you're not, please, uh, please consider it. Also, without even spending a single cent, you could do us a big help by giving a thumbs up on this video or podcast wherever you're listening or viewing this uh, episode, and please share the episode to help us build the audience. We're discussing the situation in Cuba uh, with three esteemed guests. Firstly, I'm here with Helen Yaffe, who's a senior lecturer in economic and social history at the University of Glasgow and author of We Are Cuba, How a Revolutionary People Have Survived in a Post-Soviet World. Secondly, Sajatha Fernandez, who is Professor of Sociology at the University of Sydney and author of The Cuban Hustle, Culture, Politics, Everyday Life. And thirdly, Ian Ellis-Jones. He's a retired law lecturer, a regular writer for Green Eft and author of the pamphlet which has just come out, Cuba Under Attack. So, you know, we're going to, as I said, we're going to discuss the question of what's happening in Cuba. Um, I think the protests back in July, they're now two months ago, um, but they, they certainly were a, uh, a dramatic event and they've been a reference point for, I think, a lot of commentary about Cuba since then. Um, I think at the time it was very shocking even to supporters of Cuba uh, what happened. Um, but I, what I noticed, I haven't, done, I haven't done a media analysis, but in the sort of first initial period after of those protests, there was a lot of establishment media coverage about um, about Cuba, especially criti you know, critical coverage, denouncing uh, the Cuban government. Uh, but since then, there hasn't been very much uh, that they have um, had to say about it. And uh, you know that coverage that did happen uh, was you know, massive coverage about the protests in Cuba, alongside minimal coverage of protests happening in other Latin American countries. You know, at, you know, at similar time in uh, times. And of course, we also saw things like, I mean, I guess the, the dramatic examples like uh, protests of support for the Cuban government being misrepresented, the photos, I mean, being misrepresented in the establishment media um, coverage uh, about the, the protests. Um, you know, is it, is it even fair to call them anti-government protests? I'm going to, I guess we'll leave that up to people to comment on. I think we'll start with you, Helen, if that's okay, because I, as I understand you were actually in Cuba at the time. So could you please describe these protests and I guess also comment on uh, the Cuban government's response, because that's been another thing that, that I guess there are you know, uh, you know, a lot of misinformation about. Um, and, and any information you've got about what's happened, happened in Cuba since the protests? Right. Well, I, can, um, I can't describe them firsthand, because although I was in Cuba, I didn't see any of the protests. I was leaving the quarantine hotel on the 11th of July, having arrived from the UK, um, and I travelled through a portion of Cuba and, and didn't see anything, wasn't aware of it until um, the afternoon when I was sitting down watching England in the finals of the Euro uh, Championships football. And the um, intervention was that in the middle, it was interrupted by a live broadcast speech from Miguel Diaz Canal. And he had just returned from San Antonio de los Baños a sort of area or town out on the edge of Havana, um, where it, it seems the first protest took place. Now, what happened there, um, I wasn't aware of at the time, but has subsequently heard more information. That re that area had um, had su suffered from electricity blackouts for a couple of days, and afterwards, the following day, this was sort of intricately explained by the, you know, the Minister of, uh, of Energy and, in fact, Miguel Diaz-Canal, who's an electrical engineer, um, that this was a mixture of uh, technical problems with the generator and also problems with supply because different kinds of um, energy generators require different kinds of supply. And you probably know, and in case your readers don't, uh, your listeners rather don't, we can talk more about how US sanctions has recently specifically targeted Cuba's uh, access to energy. 
Um, so uh, this had happened and apparently there is a Facebook page for that, that area and a lot of the people on it are in the area, but a lot are also in the United States and elsewhere. And the people who were based in the United States, or at least outside Cuba, started urging the residents who were actually there to go out and, and protest and complain. So they did go out and protest. Um, and the idea was to do it after the church service on the Sunday and then started to march around the area. And that march got um, grew in, uh, in size and eventually it turned violent. Now, Miguel Diaz Canal had obviously been informed about that. That's the president of Cuba. And he'd gone to the site and they showed footage of him alongside the intervention in the afternoon. This was in the morning, uh, talking to the neighbors. And he was saying to them, We understand that the situation is really hard. And we understand that you have like genuine complaints that please don't allow yourself to be manipulated by a campaign which is you know, funded from outside is part of a strategy of US intervention in our country. So what Miguel Diaz Canal, um, so what happened, it, it seems, is that, um, you know, half of the crowd are in San Antonio de los Baños are filming and it's live streaming to Facebook. And then you have the known uh, rep sort of leaders of the uh, Cuban internal opposition calling on people to to follow the example. And that's what happens in it's not clear to me how many places, maybe a dozen cities, but maybe dozens of places, because, for example, in Havana, there may have been two sites of protest. Um, so you have protests happening. Some of them are very violent and some of them involve a great deal of uh, looting, shops being um, uh, smashed and, and looting, particularly in Matanzas. In some places, um, well, in one place, for example, a children's hospital was attacked. Um, and that horrified, I mean, after the, the, that happened and the news about that was circulated, I mean, the thing that sort of normal Cubans, if you can say that, which you can't really, but, you know, most Cubans I spoke to were saying, reflecting on the protests, they were disgusted, they were horrified, they couldn't understand how it comes to a situation in a country like Cuba that does so much for, you know, children's education and health and welfare and sees children as the future and the legacy of Jose Marti and his concerns for children as the future that a, a children's hospital had been attacked on the other hand we have to recognize that many of the um, protest marches were non-violent or they were you know they were very angry and energetic but they didn't involve violence uh, there was also violence against civilians and against police bottles being thrown to be honest, those the level of violence was not shocking for most countries. Most uh, people will have, will have seen that sort of thing in their own country probably frequently. But for Cuba, it was shocking. It was very shocking to see um, protests with those numbers and that level of violence. I mean, that you know, the last violent protest of significance was 27 years ago during the worst moment of the special period in 1994, it was the Malaconasso, as it's known, a riot on the Malacon, but that was in one place. And this was generalized throughout the country. Now I have seen some media analysts who have like, um, you know, analyzed the, the footage and the information circling of the protest. And there was two interesting points that one analyst, a Mexican analyst pointed out, which I think are worth reflecting on. First of all, for authentic protests of people who are, you know, making concrete demands, they are uh, sick of uh, hardships and so on. It's very interesting that the majority of the slogans of the protests were very political, abstract slogans, or just things like the president is a, uh, you know, F, I don't know how, <laughs> how or whether we're allowed to swear on your program or, you know, uh, down with the dictatorship. But they weren't slogans like, we want food, we want medicine, which are the, the, the sort of general economic backdrop to this, right? The shortages, which as we can talk about, have been um, really imper inter externally imposed through US, the tightening of US sanctions. So that's one interesting aspect. Um, and the other is there were um, slogans like placards and logos of, um, US funded organizations, Cuba Decide, Cuba Decides, that's one of them, that were, were at this apparently spontaneous protest. And they 
um, suggest that there was a lot more preparation and they were a lot more orchestrated than the impression that was given uh, from outside. So I've talked quite a long time about them. I mean, I, I can talk about the, I'll just briefly mention, um, as I said, I wasn't involved in the protest. Miguel Diaz Canal comes on the television and he gives the most impassioned speech I've ever seen him give, you know, no notes. And he talks about the situation again, recognizing the hardships that Cubans are living through today uh, in the context of the pandemic with the tightened sanctions, which has affected their capacity to respond in health terms, which is a real shock to the Cubans. They're very proud, quite rightly, of their healthcare system. Um, and he's, he ends his speech by saying, the streets belong to the revolutionaries. And that's a kind of signal for uh, Cubans to go out and they, they, in cities and towns around the country, they take to the streets in support of the government and in support of the revolution, and we should say in support of socialism. And as you referred to, Alex, some of those images are, a uh, lot of those images are, are subsequently manipulated and presented as pro, uh, as anti-government protesters. I mean, there, it was worse than that. There was the pictures of um, 2011 on the Egyptian Malakon, uh, you know, tens of thousands of Egyptians, despite the fact that the photo, if you look carefully, had Egyptian flags, these were broad, widely circulated as being protesters in Cuba. And uh, protests at Argentina on the same day, the 11th of July, won the America's Cup football competition. And again, out celebrating, those photos were circulated. Photos of protesters in Spain against evictions who were beaten badly by police, had blood running down their faces. They were circulated as being the results of police repression in Cuba on that day. Um, I mean, even a photo of May Day, International Workers Day, I'm sure many of you uh, here participating and listening have been at um, International Workers Day in Cuba with, you know, up to a million Cubans. And those were presented as images of, uh, you know, a mass uprising. So incredible manipulation. The following day, I had to, um, obviously my first day out of quarantine, starting work, I was out in Cuba doing some work. And I traveled extensively around Havana and obviously anxiously looking, you know, I'm traveling in public transport and taxis and I didn't see any sign of any conflict or protest. I did see people gathered outside their workplaces, um, particularly the I, uh, ICRT, which is the, the Institute for Cuban Radio and Television. Um, and they were there in case, you know, there was any problems to defend their workplace. And I saw when we walked through central Havana, for example, all of the cars that were parked were tuned in to a, um, a channel and they were listening to, I think it turned out to be a four hour broadcast by the president Miguel Diaz Canal and more or less all the other ministers of government addressing the uh, genuine concerns and complaints of the population and actually talking about, you know, what efforts were being made by the Cuban government to try and resolve them uh, in a way that Fidel used to do regularly, you know, these four hour speeches that are, are quite mocked from outside Cuba, but were actually played a very important function of contextualizing for the Cuban people, the problems they face in terms of the geopolitical situation, you know, the cost, the rising cost of food, uh, how much the state subsidizes electricity and water to individuals and so on. So they were, um, you know, doing that process. And I think we've, we're, we have seen and we will continue to see a lot more of that direct dialogue between the government and the people. And there was on that Monday, I have to say for full disclosure, there was, or clarity, there was um, another violent protest on the Monday. I didn't see about see, see it, I saw it afterwards on the Cuban news. And that was again in a town on the outskirts of Havana. And that, um, that turned violent uh, with police and civilians attacked and one uh, protester was killed by the police. So that, and then after that, the only sort of mobilizations of people I saw were the following Saturday, I went to the Malacon in Havana, the, you'll know it if you've been to Havana, the sea wall. Uh, and there was a protest of between 100 and 200,000 Cubans who were there to support the revolution. Now that number was limited. They announced the event, the rally, let's say, the night before on the television. And they said, we can't, you know, we're restricting the numbers. 
uh, because of COVID. And I had plenty of friends in Cuba who said they didn't go because uh, they, you know, they didn't want to um, overcrowd the, the scenario. So they, they were attempting to have social distancing. Miguel Diaz Canal spoke at that. So did Gerardo Hernandez, who is one of the Cuban five, which many of your viewers will, um, who will, will know. And um, there, it, was a, it was an incredible atmosphere. It was like, you know, the Cubans are normally used to having this sorts of uh, political rallies and they have quite a jubilant atmosphere and, you know, it ended with music and people dancing, but they haven't had any of that because during the pandemic, all of the sort of democratic spaces, normal democratic spaces have been closed down. And I think that's definitely contributed to the problem in Cuba, but we can talk about that later. I think I've probably over talked. So over to you. No, no, it's been very fascinating. In fact, one follow up question I just wanted to check. I mean, you mentioned the uh, the intervention on the day of uh, Miguel Diaz Canal. Um, some of the hostile coverage I've seen here in Australia contrasted that with the intervention by Fidel, I think back in 1994, um, with the protests then. And they basically were sort of the, the media coverage in Australia presented that as, oh, yeah, the, the current president just had got no rapport and was like his words were uh, lost on the on the Cuban people. Is that is that in accord with what you've uh, observed or or could you ever make any comments but that's about that? It, that seems like a that seems like a contradiction if he was doing what fidel did i mean there is no one i think even fidel's enemies who would argue that fidel castro didn't have rapport with the people so um uh yeah he he was in my in my opinion doing what fidel did and that is you know a sign of the connection with people and it's very, very interesting because I cannot imagine the president of the United States being able to go where there is a protest like Black Lives Matter uh, with very minimal security. I'm sure there was security, but they're not, you know, visibly and, and uniformed and so on. Um, and, and, you know, get among the crowd and, and engage with them. So um, I um, think that the just, you know, and this is a totally subjective view because I don't know how you measure these things, but from the feedback that I've been getting from my Cuban uh, friends and colleagues, um, they they thought he did the right thing. In fact, that was something, no, lo hizo bien, he did right, he did good uh, dealing with that situation. And since then, it's been um, very... Um, uh, sort of clear that there there has been a shift in in uh, in his you know in the way that they're uh, proceeding forward and almost every day um, Miguel Diaz Canal and other leading members of the government with Gerardo Hernandez who also happens to be the president of the CDRs the uh, committees for defense of the revolution which are like the street committees in Cuba they are going every day into um, these sort of but, uh, barrios, these neighborhoods, uh, poorer neighborhoods on the edge of Havana and so on. They've been to San Isidro, which is actually not on the edge of Havana, in the central Havana, where the um, artist movement uh, has emerged. I'm, so, I'm sure your other speakers can talk about that. Um, they, they've been right into that neighborhood. They've been to Guinness, which is another neighborhood where there was a protest that turned violent. So they are what they're trying to do is dialogue with people and get them back engaged with the revolutionary process. So, you know, it's a difficult balance because from an epidemiological and disease control perspective, they have been very sensible and very strict and they're drawing on a long history of knowledge of infectious diseases. Um, so they've closed down all those communal spaces, but now they're seeing that, that there is a need. People need to get together. They need to have forums to complain and debate and listen to explanations among themselves and, you know, with with the leadership and so on. So they are, uh, I would say, rebalancing the way that this happens moving forward. And of course, the situation is going to get much easier because by November, probably by mid or end of November, the entire population over the age of two will be fully vaccinated. So they have already started their um, childhood uh, COVID-19 vaccination program. Okay, thanks very much. We'll, we'll turn to Sajatha next. I think um, the, the rest of us are, I guess, more comment, observing from the outside. But I understand, Sajatha, you have spent time in Cuba. So I'm wondering if you have got any comments to make about the protests. And I guess also one thing in particular, um, US President Joe Biden uh, described the protests as emblematic of uh, Cuba's quote uh, authoritarian regime. I'm just wondering if you if uh, that's in accord with your your experience or observations. 
Okay, thanks, Alex. And thanks, Helen, as well. I think it's really great to hear firsthand from people who've been recently in Cuba about what's going on, because so much of what we get is distorted by the media, and we receive it through all of these lenses. And, um, and so I think it's important for people to hear that. Um, yeah, I mean, when, when everything was happening, I was really, you know, trying to get in touch with all of my friends in Cuba, people who are very, you know, um, at the forefront of Afro-Cuban movements and hip hop movements, and um, who are very connected with organic social movements on the ground there. And I was texting them and, you know, trying to contact them on WhatsApp. And, um, and people just, you know, the, the internet was shut down for a few days, so I just couldn't hear from anyone one and I was you know I was pretty worried and I mean not worried in the sense of um you know that anything was going to happen to them but just wondering what was going on and um and when I finally came back online people just started saying that you know um it's uh they're, they're very suspicious you know there's there's just a lot of stuff that's happening that they feel like there's you know a lot of outside forces here who are manipulating things and um and that was the general sentiment that i got when i started reaching out to people was not what we were hearing in the west which is that these are finally the organic protests that cuba has been waiting for but that um you know there was a lot of manipulation and then we began to hear about all that like like helen mentioned and also the journalist alan mcloyd had really well documented i think a lot of these um false pictures of protests that were happening um and anyway at the same time i mean i was following a lot of the u.s coverage on cuba and you know it was it was so disingenuous how so much of the coverage was uh you know from the very beginning magnifying these protests into these very massive you know uprisings against the government um comparing to javier corrales who is a notorious um you know sort of uh commentator was was comparing it to the chilean freedom movements and to all of the sort of various uh you know pro-union pro-student worker movements across latin america and saying how you know they're, they're one and the same thing and um this was this was and, and, and the other thing that that i found particularly annoying as somebody who myself works on the history of of cultural movements within cuba is that they were being presented as the very first time that cubans were ever having a voice and ever coming out and and what i argue in my book the cuban hustle is that we've seen over many decades that there has been critical voices and critical dialogue within cuba within the arts and just because it's not anti-regime just because it's not anti-system it doesn't get reported in the media nobody ever talks about um, you know, the sort of the Afro-Cuban movement or the feminist organization Mahin, who was one of the first feminist organizations in Cuba, um, and they worked within state apparatuses. And just because of that, they never really seen as being, a, um, you know, a sort of uh, a, a legitimate social movement. It's Ioanni Sanchez. I mean, these are all the voices that get recognized because they are openly dissenting and because they fit the language of regime change, which is what the U.S., um, you know, even through Obama and all of his openings, it has continually been emphasized this, this idea of through Trump, it's been the through line of regime change um, through various stages of normalization or, um, or, or tightening of the embargo. And so um, this was what we were seeing a lot of in the, in the media coverage in, in, of, um, of these Cuban protests in the US. And, um, and at the same time, some of my friends were also dissatisfied with the ways in which the um, protests were being covered in Cuba and so there were some sort of you know of the official Cuban news newspapers who were saying these are criminals and these are bad elements and people were quite frustrated with that as well because they said you know my friends were saying well these are you know a lot of these people are just people who are frustrated things are not good here we are hungry we don't have food we don't have a lot of you know it's it's been really hard and if people want to protest they protest and i think there was a frustration on that side as well with why are we being painted why why are these people being painted in this way by the state media so um so that was there as well now um sorry you asked a question about joe biden i forgot what that part was? I said Joe Biden described the protests as emblematic of Cuba's, quote, authoritarian regime. And uh, is that in accord with your experience? Well, I mean, well, clearly, you know, a lot of this rhetoric coming from Joe Biden and, and most of the sort of American commentators was completely ideologically driven. They would never say that about, um, you know, many of the dictatorships that have they have propped up throughout Latin America. 
Um, it's very selectively targeted against Cuba, against Venezuela, which is another place I've, I've worked a lot in. And, you know, that's that's just what we see. It's, it's uh, the kind of language used against um, countries with which the United States has, um, you know, an agenda of, you know, trying to overthrow it. Uh, countries that are, are more open, that, that, you know, are committed to socialism or to redistribution or to um, contesting neoliberalism or imperialism, these are the countries that the US, you know, um, very clearly designates as in this way. So, um, you know, I think one of the things um, that, uh, that really came out in the US as well at this time was this strong kind of movement from Black Lives Matter and many others who said, you know, this is clearly, you know, uh, an effect of the embargo, that the reason we have to ask why Cubans are suffering, and yes, there are elements of um, government policy, there are elements of people wanting, you know, more of whatever, um, you know, critical spaces, whatever it is, but we cannot understand this scenario, this situation, unless we understand the cruel impact of, the, of this decades-long embargo and how it has been tightened, um, but, you know, especially under Trump, all of the changes that were made and how that is playing out right now at a time when Cuba is really struggling um, is is just cruel. And so um, I think that was the point that was being made, you know, in opposition to uh, Joe Biden and to all of the sort of um, centrist Democrats and others who were trying to uh, to sort of criticize uh, the government taking these jabs at the government was the other side of that was people were saying, well, you know, they were saying, oh, the Cuban government needs to do this and needs to do that. And people are saying, no, you need to uh, end this embargo. That is what is going to really help the Cuban people, because I think that's where the sort of rhetoric was, was aimed. Okay, thanks for that, Sajatha. We'll turn to Ian, and I guess I, I think we'll start to move on as well since you just raised it. I mean, there, there has been a long-term campaign of destabilization against the Cuban government, I mean, led particularly by the United States. Um, but so Ian, do you want to make any comments about the protests, but also, I guess, put it in the context of, um, of, this, of this, uh, yeah, this campaign of destabilization by the United States? Yeah, thank you. Look, um, Joe Biden did say that uh, Cuba, the Cuban government was authoritarian, and he also referred to Cuba as a failed state and uh, as socialism or communism as a failed ideology. I mean, it was just manna from heaven, the July 11 protests. It, it fed into the, to the Western media narrative and political narrative that socialism equals communism equals a failed ideology, a failed system. And, um, you know, it, it, the, you mentioned the, 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 the US policy over many, many years. It really begins back to, and, and the other two speakers, Sujatha and Helen, will know this, um, you know, Mallory, Lester Mallory in April 1960, or actually you can go back to Eisenhower in, in, in January 1960, who said, if the Cuban people are hungry enough, they will overthrow their government. And then you have uh, the Assistant Deputy Secretary of the State, Mallory, who said um, every possible means should be undertaken promptly to weaken the economic life of Cuba and to bring about hunger and desperation and the overthrow of the government. So really, under successive U.S. administrations, less so towards the end of the Biden administration, but basically under both Democratic and Republican administrations, that has been the U.S. policy toward Cuba, uh, to destabilize, to bring about hunger and desperation. And whilst, uh, yes, Jarth is quite right, there, there are problems. The government has been inefficient in many ways. One of the problems of central planning, it has certain advantages, but it also the certain inefficiencies involved in it as well. Uh, but the fundamental cause of the suffering that exists in Cuba is the, the, the blockade. And, um, I, you know, I, I can't see it going. I really, it, it, it's, a, it's very much a political thing. And, and Cuba is, is America's whipping boy. Um, America needs some sort of, forgive the, the sexism of whipping boy, but it's the usual expression. Um, it feeds into the, the, the myth of capitalist superiority. They need to have some country, some system of government, which they can say, look at Cuba, look at socialism, look, there's communism for you, there's socialism. It fails miserably. And of course, they don't mention that uh, we have helped to bring it about. Of course, there are many positive indicators about uh, Cuba. It has not failed in terms of health care and, um, and in terms of education. The, the advances that have taken place uh, since the revolution in those areas, the many more, are enormous. 
But of course, the the the, the, the Western media generally, and uh, the US doesn't mention that too often or at all. So just going back to the the the, the riots in in or demonstrations in so there was some rioting and looting, but they basically it was demonstrations, not the hundreds of thousands that was reported in many Western media. The social media social media played a very big part, and it began with hashtag not SOS Cuba, but hashtag SOS Matanzas. And that was then followed by the hashtag SOS Cuba. And all these uh, Twitter accounts, hundreds of them, were just opened in a matter of a day or two. You only got to need to look at the, the date of it and, and, and fake photographs of um, uh, people who were supposedly Cubans with Spanish names. Um, it was all very cleverly orchestrated from Miami. And uh, even some of the photos that I saw in The Guardian and other papers and, and, and online, some of the demonstrations were of Cuban Americans, right wing Cuban Americans in Miami. There were some street signs visible in some of the photos and others they've been whited out, but there were streets in Miami. Um, and some of the, the signs and the slogans that were being held were in English. Um, it was very much part of a color revolution and I'm sure the listeners and the others here will be familiar with that. Part of an ongoing effort at destabilizing and producing chaos with the aim of eventually producing some sort of a puppet government and regime change. It was very sad to see, really, when, when my wife first mentioned to me uh, where she'd heard it on, on the car radio, I think, about the, the demonstrations. I hadn't heard it. You know, it, there was a sinking feeling. But when, when you started to go into it, yes, there are a lot of hurting people, um, as Helen and Sujatha have mentioned, but they're not so much, the majority are not anti-government or anti the system. They're hurting. I mean, there is massive inflation at the moment. It's running somewhere between, I think, 500 and to 900%. You've had currency changes. You've, um, uh, tourism has been down about 13% bad, bad uh, exports in terms of food down about 13%. The medical call that normally produces about 10% of GDP had to be brought back to Cuba to deal with COVID, which was extremely well managed last year, but sadly got bad towards the end of last year and the beginning of this year. Um, so with all these indicators, Cuba's running very, very low on foreign currency reserves. It has an enormous debt most of which would probably will never be able to fully repay. Um, I got into a bit of a war of words with some Cuban American lawyer in Miami who eventually called me an idiot because he, I was, um, he didn't like what I was saying. I was, it, it, you know, the, the, he said to me, the, the, the embargo is working beautifully after I said that it was, it had failed measurably. He said, no, it's working beautifully. And, and, um, they, many people like him feel that it is working very, very well in recent times. And uh, that's rather sad to hear. But I have faith that, um, you know, the Cubans, as, as, as Helen documented in her wonderful book, have been through very bad times before. And I'm confident that they're very resilient and resourceful people. I'm confident that they will get through this, but it's not going to be easy. Thanks for that, Ian. Yeah, back to Sajatha and on this sort of campaign of destabilization. I know you, I understand you at least you've done work on the sort of uh, the the conscious attempt by the United States to use hip hop as a as a means of um, you know trying to foment uh, discontent and and I guess counter revolution. Do you have any comments about that? Yeah, I mean, so so hip hop culture is something that you know, with the whole long tradition of various black cultures in Cuba, um, came to Cuba in you know in about the eighties and nineties, and uh, was something really taken on by particularly young black Cubans who were feeling the effects of the hardships of the special period and were looking for avenues to talk about it and to um, and to and to raise the issue of racism in which you know had never really been talked about openly because it was assumed that the revolution had resolved issues of race and um and so the, the hip-hop movement really took off in in the 90s um which was when i was there and and through into the 2000s was when it was really at its height 
Um, and, and, and this was a, it's a very grassroots movement that sort of moved from, uh, from the streets into, you know, government institutions and, uh, and, and, and was incredibly powerful, had a, had a very important global reach, which, um, you know, people from all over the world kind of came to know about, about Cuban hip hop. And so uh, at the same time, I think it was around the mid 2000s, which is when they first started trying to sort of infiltrate into the Cuban hip hop movement. So there were all these kinds of um, uh, various programs uh, started by the Cuban, uh, by, by the, sorry, by the US government to try to infiltrate Cuban hip hop. And, and a few of them actually, I mean, I, when I lived in New York, I received several visits um, from the US State Department to my home, trying to find out what I knew about Cuban hip hop so that they could use that in their programs. And I eventually got a lawyer who, um, who told them not to contact me anymore because it's actually, you know, they, they can't actually do that. But this was all this period during the, the decade of the 2000s, which was when um, they first began uh, trying to infiltrate into the Cuban hip hop movement. And it was a really, it, it was really quite an awful thing because on the one hand, um, the way they did it was very insidious. They put Cuban uh, artists in danger. They, um, you know, expose them to, um, you know, to possible retaliation. And, uh, you know, this was all done under the banner of these regime change programs that happened alongside other programs like um, Sunzenio, which was an attempt to start up a Cuban Twitter, which would then be used to sort of foment a revolution on the ground and have people sort of all call each other into some kind of uprising. And again, it totally failed. And, you know, what I've said is that the reasons that these have always failed is because, Cuban hip hop was a very strong cultural movement built from the ground up and a US State Department could never um, uh, could never produce something that was, um, you know, uh, compelling enough for Cuban youth to actually believe that, you know, that it was real. And, and so all of their attempts to, to sort of prop up these groups and try to, um, you know, push them in, in a different anti-regime direction, they, they really failed. And uh, in more recent years, um, you know, the, the, uh, the, especially the sort of uh, various, you know, groups that have come up in, in say, just uh, the most recent times have taken on a more radical direction to the ones that I knew. So, so for instance, the, the, the organizations and the groups that I knew, um, you know, all the way up until, say, um, the decade of the 2000s were always people who didn't see themselves as anti-regime. They saw themselves as working within the revolution. They were very critical. And when they spoke about race, they criticized the race blindness of the Cuban government. And they had very strong and very powerful things to say, but they were never calling on the streets for an end to the revolution. And I think that's the difference between them and the more recent groups. Now, I don't believe that all of the recent Cuban rap groups were ones who were either, um, you know, financed by the um, US government or who are financed by, um, you know, by sort of anti-regime foreign organizations. I don't think that's true. I think there's just been a natural progression within hip hop towards a much more critical stance than earlier. That's a generational change. And the people I know um, talk about that quite openly. They just say, you know, that that new group is, is it's just a much more critical group. But it also did um, open up the door for, um, for this kind of you know, continued infiltration that I think connects with today's protests. I can't really talk about that because I don't know enough about it, unfortunately. I don't really know. Um, I've heard different accounts and different versions from different people, and I don't know enough to sort of make my own judgment. I'd have to sort of be in Cuba, I think, and, um, and be more on the ground to know. But I definitely, but what I can say about the situation today is that yes, there is there is definitely that does continue, and I think um, that it has produced a, a sort of divide within the Cuban hip hop movement between those who um, who don't you know buy into that sort of um, uh, uh, more radical, critical um, you know anti regime stance, and who are somewhat suspicious of the ways in which um, that has been manipulated by outside groups, um, and then those who I think um, are very openly anti government, are very openly critical in their politics. Thanks for that, Sajatha. And we'll turn back to Helen. Um, I wonder if you would like to make some comments about the US destabilization campaign against Cuba. But one thing I'm hoping you might comment on in particular 
Uh, there's a lot of commentary now about, you know, will Joe Biden or won't he go back to the, the policy that Obama had of sort of loosening the blockade? I mean, that's that, what Joe Biden actually does is one thing. But I guess I wanted to, I guess my view is that the Obama policy, while it was a welcome development, it was simply a different means of trying to undermine and attack the Cuban revolution rather than an actual reversal of policy. So I'm wondering if you don't make any comments about that. Okay, um, so to start with the first aspect, I mean, um, Ian was talking about Lester Mallory's memorandum from 6th of April, 1960. Um, and I think what we need to understand is that um, with the tightening of the sanctions under the Trump administration, and then a social media war against Cuba, very much part of that regime change programs, there you have the contemporary manifestation of what we can call the two track uh, uh, strategy towards Cuba. So economic asphyxiation, in order to create that discontent, that disconnect between the leadership and the people, um, basically suffering and hunger, as, as Ian said, um, in order to foster an internal, uh, internal opposition movement. So if you think about what's happened recently, um, I mean, you had the rapprochement with, with under Obama, and um, yeah, I agree with essentially what you're saying. If you look at what happened, I mean, under Obama, Obama, I'm sure that you had this too. People would come up to you and say, "But, but the, but Obama's got rid of the blockade, right?" <laughs> like, no, not at all, not even marginally. All he's done is facilitated a few commercial exchanges, which, um, which were very much one directional, right? So, uh, U.S. companies could come to Cuba to uh, to invest and make money. So, cruise ships, a couple of banks, a couple of um, hotels, chartered flights. But only one example of a Cuban uh, firm that could could export, and that was because it was arranged by the lawyer of Alan Gross, and it was a cooperative, so it was non-state, and it was charcoal made of marabou. Uh, anyway, so the point is, it was very much focused on uh, the diplomatic and political side, so lots of bilateral commissions that were talking but very little done. And in fact, the US embargo, which is, we should understand, you know, what is the embargo? What is the blockade? It's a set of six overlapping, extraordinarily complex, very, very comprehensive laws. Um, and, you know, th those were not effective, right? So, because he did it all by executive decree and then Trump comes along and says, everything that Obama did by executive decree, I can undo because, you know, when I'm president. And so, of course, they threw money at him, the Miami Cuban community, they threw money and, and he, you know, and with the aim of winning Florida and he wins the election. So um, what happens then if you look at this, the sequence of how they have persecuted Cuba's revenue, right? Cuba has um, two main sources of revenue. One is the medical, the export of medical services. So immediately they start targeting that. So before Bolsonaro becomes president of Brazil, he's already making threatening comments to the extent that the Cubans are concerned they have to withdraw their uh, tens of thousands of Cuban medical professionals that were being paid um, to, to serve underserved populations in Brazil. And that started, of course, because they were trying to, under uh, Rousseff, Dilma Rousseff, the previous president, they were trying to reach communities that had no doctors. So, you know, these Cubans turned up, at one point there was 13,000 and they were the only doctors many of those populations had seen. And when they've gone, they've gone, you know, those are communities that go back to no healthcare. And when you look at the devastation that COVID has wrecked, you know, it came just shortly afterwards in those same communities, then it helps us to contextualize, you know, why it was so devastating. And the same with, Bolivia and Ecuador, you know, as the uh, countries of Latin America, there was a swing to the right. There were um, coups and, you know, Bolivia, for example, uh, parliamentary coups as well as they're called through legal means. And so Cuba um, was impacted by a loss of revenue from the export of medical services. But on top of that, then you have COVID. So, you know, the other important source of revenue is uh, tourism. And then Cuba very sensibly closes its borders. Um, but it actually, the figures you gave in, I think are a massive understatement. I think it, it lost like 75% of uh, the tourism 
in the first year and that was when tourism was was going until something like the 24th of march right so you're talking about something like a 95 percent fall in tourism which means their you know revenue between uh for for the financial year so absolutely devastating at the same time what is the another source of income to cuba remittances from the united states but also from um europe as well and other countries and the u.s you know, under Trump, they squeeze and squeeze that. So now you can say it's practically impossible to send money to Cuba. You know, and as someone who's, I've been to Cuba twice during the pandemic and people are, you know, please help me get some money there. You know, well, they've got no other means. So um, you've you've cut off that, which was estimated as between 2.4, 2.5 and 4 billion a year. So you've cut off all of Cuba's sources of in, um, of revenue and the Cubans have had to deal with that reality, right? Now we can have a long discussion about why Cuba uh, continues to be so dependent on the import of foods. And I can talk about the history of, you know, creating dependency through the legacy of the sugar plantations and so on. But the fact is that Cuba needs foreign uh, exchange it needs hard currency to purchase on the international market under um, conditions that are not opposed on any other country in the world so while it does buy or what has been buying food from the united states it has to pay in cash up front you know and the um, the other measure that the trump administration took was an incredible persecution of you uh, of cuban financial transactions through the international system so in 2019, the Wall Street Journal said 88% of all international transactions are carried out in the US dollar. The US can determine whether those tra transactions um, carry on or not. The, U the Cubans have been using to circumvent the, the impact of the sanctions. They've been using something called U-turn transactions. The Trump administration elim eliminated those. So, you know, um, it's it's almost impossible now for Cuban entities to get money in or out of the country to, to make payments for goods. And it, what it means is that um, they have to, you know, buy from whoever's willing to sell at whatever price they're willing to sell and increased transport costs. They also lost the, you know, the, there was a massive a decrease in the trade with Venezuela for problems, internal problems to Venezuela, which are again, a product of US sanctions in part. And, um, you know, what that meant is they were trading oil from Venezuela with medical services. That was money they didn't have to pay. So now that Venezuela is unable to import that or export that to Cuba, they have to find that money alternative. Then you have COVID on top of that. And, you know, because the Cubans have been so effective in their response, as you mentioned in, um, I think Ian mentioned in 2020, they had 146 deaths in the entire year. I mean, I made a documentary about it. It's uh, on YouTube. It's Cuba and COVID-19, public health science and solidarity. They, you know, have invested masses in resources to hospitalize medical, supervise hosp uh, hospital admissions and, and monitoring and track and trace and all the rest of it. But they were forced as, in a set essence in November to open their borders to um, to tourism or really to Cuban Americans and Cuban uh, Cubans in Spain and Europe and so on, countries with very high incidence of COVID, they were forced to open their borders uh, for economic reasons. And because people wanted to go back and see their families. And then you had basically the community contagion and they lost control of, of uh, COVID and you have the new, the new variants, Delta and so on. I mean, the good news is, that they, uh, in their analysis, the vaccines that they have developed, and I think it's worth saying, you know, they have five yeah. COVID-19 vaccines. Um, they were, the clinical trials when they took place, there were like 10 strains of COVID-19 circulating in Havana. So they have been tested in, in fire in, in a sense, much more than the Pfizer and the Moderna, which were rushed out very quickly and were only tested as far as I understand, and I'm not a medical scientist, but against the, the original strain. Um, the Cubans have said that the, the vaccines are working against the Delta strain as opposed to the, you know, the other um, vaccines, so international vaccines, which are um, showing a decreased efficacy. So you have it, so what you have there, all this stuff that I've been describing, is the ingredients of economic asphyxiation.
Um, when you cut off tourism in old Havana, the cruise ships that come to the port of Havana, a lot of those poorer, more marginal um, barrios around Havana, those people have lost their income because they're also there, whether it's formal employment or informal employment, they're also um, getting income from those tourists who are visiting, whether it's through the uh, Paladar, if private restaurants, selling cigars, showing them around, whatever it is. So, um, you know, it's really been, they've re it's, <laughs> it's been a perfect storm for Cuba. And at the same time, as I said, closing down social, political uh, and, um, and workplace forums. So, you know, Cubans, the universities are closed, the schools are closed, uh, work, lots of workplaces are closed or people are doing one day in, one day out to minimise the number of people inside or they're working from home. And so you really close down alternative forums uh, in relation to places where people can go and you know make their complaints anyone who's lived in Cuba will know that Cubans do complain they complain um, and they critique and they you know and for I always see this as a, as a healthy sign because actually you know if you don't think anyone's listening you don't bother complaining right but they have these forums and that you know every everyone in Cuba thinks their opinion really matters um, so those forums have been closed down. And so you have this incredible influence from social media. You have these young people just hooked on their phones, not just young people, all sorts of people hooked on their phones and the influence that's coming. And, and at the same time, and I really want to reiterate, uh, to, to state this, you have these YouTubers and social media influencers who are, their behavior is absolutely shocking. I mean, they, I've just listened to one today calling, uh, saying the only solution is cu in Cuba is to go out and kill all the communists. Just kill them. That's the only way. Do it quickly. Do it early. You know, millions mm. of people, kill all the communists, kill all the police. You know, and, um, you know, now people are, the liberals are reacting with shock. Oh, Cuba's introduced a new internet law that says it's illegal to promote that kind of violence. Well, you know, actually it did it long after Spain, long after Britain long after the United States, which all have internet laws. But so we have to understand, like, um, it's so it's so sort of targeted. The most English speakers won't be aware. But in YouTube and in these other social media channels, there are people every day calling on Cubans to go out onto the street to protest, but also offering money, offering phone credit to go and carry out arson, to attack police, uh, but to film themselves, even if it's a, a one person job, right? The point is not that it's supposed to represent a mass movement, but to film yourself doing it because it's more material to circulate on social media. So that is all going on. And also in relation to what you were saying about the, the hip hop movement, the, you know, I'm sure there is division and I'm sure there is more critique, but some of that is also externally driven, as I'm sure you know, because these YouTubers are saying um, in this era of sort of rapprochement with Obama, there was a, a, a flourishing of cultural exchange and lots of Cubans were traveling to the US and these YouTubers started to say um, these this band or this group is playing at this venue. And, you know, last year they 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 said something nice about Fidel Castro. So phone the venue and get them, as they say, blacklisted, get, you know, get the venue to withdraw uh, from the from the concert. And so, you know, they, they were, there were a lot of artists who basically sold their soul because they were more concerned about um, their careers than, you know, having any sort of uh, uh, loyalty to to the revolution in an abstract sense. And um, I think that, we, you know, we have to be clear on that. So, you know, these artists, I mean, people are pulling out photos from 10 years ago. You were at an event with a member of, you know, a member of the government and they're having to come out and go, no, I was only 18. I didn't know what I was doing. You know, it's just it's just incredible pressure of being applied from every angle. And in fact, you know, I wasn't surprised by the protest. It was surprising to see it was sort of um, uh, you know, the number of people, the number of places and so on. But I had written in in June, I'd written a report about the economic and political situation. And I said, up to this point, Cubans have shown incredible endurance, but we shouldn't be surprised to see explosions, uh, social explosions in response to the situation. So it's all of those things. It's very, very complicated. But how humiliating for a country that has literally saved millions of lives and improve millions of lives around the world to now have to depend on solidarity arrivals, deliveries of 
oxygen, of medicine. You know, for a country that has a world leading biotech sector that has the only country in Latin America and the Caribbean with COVID-19 vaccines, the hope for the global South, you know, many populations know that if it's not for Cuba, they won't get vaccines in the next four or five years. So, you know, and how just, it's just this agonizing dichotomy. They have the vaccines, but they are turning to, or depending on, or, or getting support from the international solidarity movement to buy, to buy syringes to buy the syringes that they need to carry it out. So I want to end on one thing um, in relation to, to you know, what we can do about it, because Ian was talking about the resilience of the Cubans, and obviously my book was about how they survived uh, the, the special period, but this is an unprecedented situation. And, you know, really, uh, Cuba needs support and solidarity. It's given enough all over the world throughout the decades. And what we need to do is realize that, yes, the blockade, I agree with you, Ian, I cannot see an end to the US blockade, certainly under current conditions. However, the blockade is technically a bilateral issue in the sense that it's US law to target trade with Cuba. Now, why is it not, in fact, a bilateral issue? Because the US uses its leverage over the dollar and the international system to impose its national law on the rest of us. So what can we do? Well, what we can do is um, push our own legal systems and political systems to implement domestic law. I'm sure it's the same in Australia, but in 1996, Britain passed a law which said it was illegal to implement the US blockade to impose it on individuals or entities in Britain because it's their national law, it's not British law. And British um, law and uh, also the attitude of the government formally is that we have trade and in exchange with Cuba. So what I would say is that if we could eliminate the extraterritorial character of the blockade, in other words, if we could reduce it so it doesn't affect Cuba's trade with the rest of the world, then you know there would be a ma that would be a massive um, reduction of the economic and political pressure on Cuba. So in that way, rather than you know us watching or listening to this podcast, thinking, "Oh God, how depressing!" You know, this is the unprecedented situation. They're not going to get rid of the blockade. What can we do? We can do something. We can demand that our own governments are consequent or consistent with their own legal systems and refuse to allow the US blockade to affect our, us as individuals and entities in our national territories. Yes, thanks for that, Helen. In fact, um, far from being depressing, I think actually Cuba is the exact opposite. It's actually a, it's a tremendous inspiration uh, throughout the whole world and uh, certainly for the left, but, uh, but, but more generally. Um, we, we'll finish up with a, uh, with a final round of speakers uh, from everybody just to sort of finish up. Um, including maybe you could address, as Helen did, the question of um, how to build solidarity in the current circumstances. Anything else you want to say? You go first, you go first Ian, then we'll go Ian, Sajatha and Helen, then we'll finish up. Thank you. I just wanted to clarify one thing. Um, Helen, maybe I didn't express it as well, or Helen misunderstood. When I mentioned 13% in relation to tourism, I was referring to the percentage of GDP. And tourism is normally about 13 to 16%. Um, yeah, in 2019, I think you had about 4.2 million people that went to Cuba, tourists. Uh, last year, because of COVID, it was down to about 1 million or less. So certainly you've got about a 90% reduction there. But I was talking in terms of GDP, um, not a 13% de decrease in the number of tourists. Sorry, sorry, I misunderstood that then. That's all right. That's all right. Look, you mentioned about six acts that uh, refer to... Uh, that, that, that constitute the, the embargo. One of them is the Cuban Democracy Act of 1992. You may have mentioned that. And that actually forbids any ship that is docked in, in a Cuban port from docking in, um, in a US port, state or territory, for another six months. Now, normally a ship would go with a cargo to, say, Havana uh, and then move on to America, but uh, it can't. Therefore, they say to the Cuban government, well, we're missing out on, you know, 50% or more uh, trade with America because we can't go to America as we would normally have done. So this increases the shipping costs for Cuba to you know thirty to fifty percent. But look, um, it, 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 you know, and it's distressing because uh, the Helms Burton Law, which you alluded to, and Title Three, I mean, um, the U.S. government is legally bound to interfere in 
to persecute uh, other tr transactions and other countries trading with Cuba and to hinder the necessary financial transactions and even sabotage sea transportation. I, I think there is a lot we can do with legislation to protect against America's threats, reprisals and retaliatory actions, um, but it's, 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 it's quite a tricky thing. Um, I'm so, it's humiliating for Cuba to see so many countries that have recently been so generous to Cuba with food and medicine and supplies of oxygen, as was mentioned by Helen. Um, America too, there has the Alibaba Foundation, there was something like 2 million masks and uh, 40,000 rapid diagnostic kits and a lot of oxygen ventilators, over a hundred, and they were all blocked by the US. But look, I'm getting a bit negative there. I'm, I'm pleased that the Australia Cuba Friendship Society um, raised a lot of money. I can't remember the exact sum, but you know, for a small body, it was about 10 or 12,000, plus a lot of masks and um, other things that have gone to Cuba. There's a lot that we can do. Uh, Cuba can, I think, survive without trade with America. It's up to other countries like Britain. And you know, even when Prince Charles and his wife went to Cuba a couple of years ago, with a view to opening up trade between Britain and Cuba, which has in fact happened, I understand. It's up, Australia has very little trade with Cuba, but Canada does. It's up to others, as Helen said, to fill the void created by America. And it's more than a void, of course, it's a, it's, it's a horrible mess and a very repressive. Thank you. Thanks, Ian. Any final comments from you, Siddhartha? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that uh, we are in a, a, a really kind of um, uh, tense and critical moment right now in relation to Cuba, uh, because as others have outlined, you know, this sort of dire situation on the ground, the fact that the embargo doesn't seem to be going anywhere. And I, I think that uh, Cuba has become a heightened target for all the reasons we know about, because for decades, um, you know, the, the, the sort of the existence of the Cold War, all of the reasons that the sort of domestic politics of the US with, with Cuban Americans and their vote. But I think there's something really unique right now, which is that we're seeing the sort of rise and popularity of socialism in general. And that's an extremely scary thing for, um, for the ruling elite, basically. And, and Cuba represents that. And I think by, uh, continuing by by sort of uh, presenting Cuba as this bogeyman, by presenting Cuba as this evil place run by dictators, um, what they're doing is they're trying to, I mean, you know, people like Bernie Sanders, people like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez are talking about socialism. Socialism is something that has become so much more mainstream in recent years, and, and that's an extremely terrifying thing. So, so Cuba in some ways is sort of bearing the, the ideological brunt of that in terms of its symbol as, as this kind of alternative that could exist to capitalism that otherwise, you know, when we talk about anti-capitalism, it's fairly vague, but when we can see in practice what it might mean, um, it becomes, you know, something that needs to be, uh, you know, shown to be evil in order to sort of build up the, the, the sort of, um, um, you know, to, to, to make that critique. So um, this is why I see this as, as a really sort of heightened moment uh, in, the, in the global scenario. Um, I, I think it's really important within the solidarity, you know, within building solidarity that we really always emphasize Cuban sovereignty, that we emphasize um, the, 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 the right of the Cuban people and, um, you know, organizations and people within Cuba to determine their own destiny, to make their own decisions. And um, for me personally, that always comes down to the people and the organizations I know on the ground who are um, who are involved on the island in making change, in being involved in politics from feminist organizations to the Afro-Cuban movement to um, all kinds of cultural organizations and media organizations. There are so many of these groups within Cuba that we never hear about because they're never reported about. And um, all of these groups uh, are part of, of a whole sort of, you know, critical sphere now at times, you know, they themselves say, we feel like we're, you know, we don't, we, we're not able to, to, uh, to talk. We don't have um, the, the critical space that we want. And that's part of their struggle. That's part of their fight for more critical spaces and opening up more critical spaces. 
Um, and so, you know, I always take my lead from them. I feel like when I, you know, want to know, when I hear about an issue, I feel like hearing from those people on the ground who are themselves in the trenches, who are, um, you know, in that environment and who are quite capable of articulating how they see Cuba's future, what they want for Cuba's future. And, you know, and, and I, I, I would love to hear more of those voices in, in that struggle. Thank you. Thanks, Ajatha. And Helen, final comments from you. Um, I think we've covered a lot. I mean, I think that Sujafa has hit the nail on the head, really. And what Cuba is, is the, the threat of a good example um, by having an alternative socialist development uh, system. And there's so much that, you know, when I started writing my book, We Are Cuba, I looked at different areas and it was like, oh, wow, Cuba's doing really well there. Why? Because these are not areas of, um, motivated by profit and, you know, speculation and so on. So public health um uh you know medical science sustainable development uh, climate change adaptation that's what the the new work that i'm doing is looking at cuba's tarea vida life task state plan to confront climate change but um also you know as ian said when biden made a statement he he combined the two things he said cuba is a failed state socialism is a failed ideology and that just shows that what cuba's great crime in fact, Fidel Castro said it in 1961. He said, our great crime is that we have um, carried out a socialist revolution, you know, on their doorstep under the shadow of the eagle and so on. And so, and that's clear what it's about, but it's for all those reasons that we need to look to Cuba, learn, uh, study Cuba, learn about their, their, their creative collective solutions to problems that we all face. Um, I encourage people to move away from Cuban exceptionalism. Cuba is a small island in the Caribbean. It's not alone in that. It's been subject to 400 years of colonialism and imperialism. It's not alone in that. It shares a lot of features with Latin America and the Caribbean So, and, and the global south in general. So um, I would encourage people to, um, you know, just, just really learn more about the real Cuba and see what's at stake, because if if we lose the... Cuban revolution, then we, as we say, as Sujafa says, we lose uh, the example that, um, you know, it is possible to, to construct a society in a different way that puts human beings at the centre. Thank you very much, Helen. Thanks also to, to uh, Ian and Sujatha as well. I should have actually mentioned at the beginning, Resistance Books has just recently put out two new pamphlets. Uh, one is Ian's book, uh, Cuba Under, pamphlet, Cuba Under Attack. The other one is a is a collection of um, seven speeches by Fidel. Uh, they're both available for free download as PDFs on the um, Social Science website. So we'll put a link in the video description for that. And we'll also put links for um, Helen and Sajatha's books as well. Uh, so, and yes, uh, finally, I should also say, if you do like our work, please become a, a Green F supporter because it is the best way to, to support our work and, and as well as to receive the material that we um, that we produce. But thanks everybody for watching or listening. Uh, please uh, share this episode. Thanks especially to um, Helen and Sajatha and Ian. I think it's been a really fantastic discussion. Thank you very much.